Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon. Uh, we take your phone calls during this hour. If you have questions you'd like to raise for conversation about the Bible, about the Christian faith, or anything uh, related thereunto, maybe you see things differently from the host and want to balance comment, the number to call in is 844-484-5737. Thirty-seven. Right now, the phone lines seem to be full, so if you uh, call a few minutes from now, you might have a better chance of getting through. The number is 844-484-5737. Uh, this Saturday, we have a couple of events in Southern California. They only happen once a month, the third Saturday of each month. One is a morning men's Bible study in Temecula at 8 o'clock Saturday morning this Saturday, and the other one is an evening meeting for anybody uh, who wants to come, uh, it's, it's 6 o'clock in Buena Park, and uh, what we do there is we're going through a, a different book of the Bible every month, and we're going through the book of Titus uh, this Saturday. You're welcome to join us. If you're interested in those meetings but you don't know where they are, you can find out by going to thenarrowpath.com. And going to the tab that says announcements, and there you find all that information. If you already know because you've been to these meetings before, just show up and we'll be glad to see you again. Now, one other thing. We've had uh, mobile apps for this program, for our website and so forth, for years. And the man who made the original iPhone app has just come out with a, a new app uh, for this uh, ministry. It's, it's better. Uh, one thing it does, uh, if you listen to one of the lectures or even the audio books at our website, uh, our, our app formerly did not hold your place and remind you where to come back to if you left it and came back. Uh, it does that now. And so it's it's got more functionality. It's got more things from our website there. And uh, you, uh, it works for Android and for iPhone. That's something our former iPhone app did not. We had an iPhone app and an Android app <coughs> made by different people. And they had different uh, functionalities. But the iPhone app had the most functionality. And this new one works on both iPhone and Android and has more functionality than any of the previous ones. And so I would like to recommend that you get it. Of course, it's free. Uh, however, unlike the previous apps, you can't get them from the uh, Google Play or from uh, the, the App Store. You download this from an actual website, but it's not hard to do. Um, you go to the narrow path dot app. Okay, not not our website, not the dot com, but the narrow path dot app. And you should there find all the instructions necessary. There's a how to section showing how to download it onto your phone or your device or whatever. And then you'll have the the best app the, to access all the material from our website. You can listen to these programs, you can call the program from there. You can listen to all the lectures uh, on the website. You can go to the YouTube channel from there. Uh, it's, it's got everything, <coughs> or almost everything. So uh, check that out. That's uh, thenarrowpath.app. Go there and download it onto your phone or your iPad or whatever, and you will have everything we have to offer right in your hand or in your pocket. All right, let's... Uh, Let's talk first of all to Jimmy from Staten Island, New York. Now, I should have probably taken someone else first because Jimmy called yesterday, and we don't want one caller to dominate every day. But we'll give you another chance, Jimmy. I know. Uh, go ahead. Hi, Steve. Well, thank you for taking my call. Uh -huh. um, I have one verse I would like to lead up to it with two other verses in First Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So if you have a free will gospel, what you're doing, you're taking away assurance. Here it's saying we're kept by the power of God. Uh, sheep love the shepherd because the shepherd is able to keep them. But you're saying that a sheep can make the power of God null and void by their own free will. Now, God cannot have a free will, and man have free will at the same time. Why not? So, 
All right. Uh, and one, one more verse. Let, in, let, in let, first no, no, no. Okay. Let's not take right. another verse yet. Let's talk about this one first. And I want to ask you okay. some questions. But first of all, to say that God cannot have free will and man have free will at the same time, that's not true. When I was raising my children, I could give them free will to do certain things during some of the hours of their day. They still had to do what I required them to do other hours of the day. And even, even when I gave them free will, there, you know, there were things they weren't able to do. For example, they couldn't drive the car when they were seven years old. I mean, there were things they didn't have unlimited free will. But they certainly had at times of the day, and uh, at times when I didn't dictate what they were doing. They could make their own free choices. And that was part of my free will to let them do so. Because my free will would have allowed me, or my sovereignty, I guess we could call it, would have allowed me, if I wanted to, to schedule every waking moment of their day so they'd have no free will, no choices. Uh, however, I chose to give them free will. I, gave, I chose to give them opportunities to make choices of their own. That is something that God can do too, and in my opinion, something he has done. Now, you said that if you have free will, uh, you know, you can't have any assurance of salvation. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if, if you don't mind. I know you're coming from the Calvinist point of view, and the Calvinists believe that if you're really one of the elect, that you will persevere in faith until you die. You believe that, I suppose, Jimmy, right? If it's the faith of Christ that's in me, okay. yes. Okay, so if you're one of the elect and you're saved, you will never depart from the faith. So let me just ask you about a situation, and I'd just like to are know you, your analysis of it. If I could. Are you going to go to Luke 15 again? No. Because you always go to the prodigal son, but you never go to the shepherd. But anyway, go on. Well, I could go to the shepherd if you want to, but that's not important right now. The, uh, the point I'm going to go to is the question, what if there's a person, and I've known people like this, who receive Christ, they rejoice in salvation, they're delivered from uh, sinful bondages and addictions, they serve God, they lead other people to Christ, and they live a holy life for several years. But then they fall away. They go back into their old life, they die of drug overdoses or commit suicide or do something like that after they've gone, uh, left the faith. Uh, now, would you say that person was one of the elect or not? No, Matthew 7. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we okay. prophesied in your name? Okay, so, so this person then, this person has lived a holy life, an obedient life for years, has experienced the deliverance from sin and addictions in their life for years, has rejoiced in their salvation for years, but they weren't really saved ever right. because they weren't really. Okay, so then how can you have any assurance of salvation? Because you haven't endured to the end of your life yet. Maybe These people had all the same things going on in their life, that you have that would convince you that you're one of the elect. And yet, if you die because in I, unbelief, then you weren't saved even now. That's your view, right? In Romans 8, it says, His Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. Right, it's and an those people had that too. It's an individual case. That I, what's that? Yeah, those people had that too. They would have testified the same thing. So how, how are you different than they are? How am I different? I can't yeah. prove to you how different I am from somebody else. All I know is I get assurance from the Word of God that I am his child. Okay, and so did they. And so did they. And you know what? I have a good friend who is a, a Calvinist minister, a very strong Calvinist minister. And I used to have breakfast with him every morning because he was a very dear friend of mine. But he was also quite a consistent Calvinist. He said he had no assurance of his salvation, even though he lived a godly life. He was totally dedicated to God. He felt the assurance of God's spirit, witness with his spirit. Uh, you know, he led people to Christ. He was a faithful minister of God uh, and never fell away. But he said he could not have assurance of salvation because if he would fall away, as some people with his history have been known to do, uh, then he would, he would prove that he was not even now saved. All this time that he thought he was saved, he would prove that it was only a delusion because you only are really saved if you persevere to the end. And no one knows if that will happen. Now, you can say you know that you will, but so did lots of people think, think that as strongly as you think it, who did fall away. In other words, that doctrine gives you no actual assurance of salvation, unless you're simply arrogant and say, well, they could be wrong, but I cannot be, you know, because I'm one of the, I'm, I'm, I, because I'm me. I'm one of the elect because I'm me. And they were wrong about themselves, but I'm not wrong about myself. Nothing but arrogance can, can make that statement. The truth is there are people who have every evidence of being saved that you have and who have sometimes, in some cases, have fallen away. And by your theology, they never were saved. And until you die without falling away, 
you cannot really say for sure if you're safe. So as far as I'm concerned, your teaching uh, is what deprives a person of, of assurance. My teaching is that if I trust in Christ, if I'm a follower of Jesus, if I have the evidence of his spirit bearing witness with my spirit, all that, then I know I'm saved. I also know that if I would apostatize and reject Christ and turn against him, that I wouldn't be saved. It wouldn't mean I wasn't now. It would mean I'm not then. Because following Christ, just like any relationship between you and any other person, is something that's maintained day by day in an ongoing basis. So, so this is what I'm saying. You can say that a person who has free will can have no assurance of salvation. I have free will, but I do have assurance of salvation. You know why? Because I have decided that I'm not going to fall away. Now, of course, uh, and God knows that too. Uh, now, but there are other people who have uh, decided they weren't going to fall away, and, and for some reason they, they turn back. But uh, uh, even, you know, even Peter failed at one point, though he was certainly, by your doctrines, one of the elect. He denied Christ three times, and Jesus said, whoever denies me before me, you know, I'll deny him before my father. Fortunately, Peter did turn back to Christ. Uh, but had he died uh, without turning back, then we'd have to wonder, was he ever really saved or not? You see, I don't believe that we're, we determine whether we're saved today by what we end up doing 10 years from now. We, we know we're saved today by where we stand today. Are we followers of Christ or not? If we're following Christ, then we are. So, so I believe so, we do have, so, I do believe so, we do have assurance. So yeah. what, what you're saying in verse 5, these people are not kept by the power of God, the ones that yes. fall away. Oh, yeah, but you, you, you're leaving out a word. We're kept by the power of God, he says, through faith. Through faith. Right, exactly. So, so who's doing the believing, me or God? I'm doing the believing. The Bible commands me to believe. It never commands God to believe. God doesn't have to believe. I do have to believe. That's my responsibility. And believing is what faith is. So if I'm believing, that's called faith. And my faith, my believing, accesses the power of God, keeping me moment by moment. I'm kept by the power of God through faith. So, I, you know, God's power is what keeps me. My faith is what keeps that power uh, and me in, in a right relationship. If I uh, abandon Christ, then that power will not be in my favor. It'll be uh, used, you know, it'll be contrary to me. But uh, the faith that I have is the access. That's what uh, Ephesians 2.8 says. By grace you've been saved through faith. Okay, so... Through faith, that's the conduit, grace comes to me, and that saves me. So, and I think good grace is the power of God, too. So uh, we're saved by grace, or through the power of God, we are kept through our faith. Now, there are people who have faith today, but they don't have it, you know, 10 years from now. Well, while I have faith, I'm being kept by the power of God. If I abandon the faith, and the Bible does say many will depart from the faith, so that happens, uh, well then... I won't be kept by the power of God in that case. That's why we, that's why Peter says we need to fear. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 that if you call God your father, who without respect of persons judges everyone according to his works without partiality, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. The fear of God is what Jesus said we should live in, what Paul says we should live in, what Peter says we should live in, certainly what the Old Testament says we should live in. And the reason for the fear of God is because Nobody is a shoe in when it comes to salvation. We have to make it to the end of the battle. Now, we can be sure that as long as we trust God, God will give us sufficient power to make it safely through the battle. But not everyone stays in the faith. And that's a choice, by the way. A person can choose to believe or not. Uh, and that's, of course, you and I have different theology about that. But, but yeah, we're kept by the power of God through faith. You see, his readers had faith. And that faith was keeping them by the power of God. But if they would give up the faith, as Peter said, for example, in Second Peter chapter 2, it would be better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned away. So uh, Peter doesn't assume that everyone who has faith at one point is going to have it forever. But while we do have it, it is through that means that the it's power of the God faith keeps is us. The, fruit, the faith is the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So, No, faith is not the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, there is in the King James Version the word faith in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, but almost all translations since the King James would recognize that's talking about faithfulness. Faithfulness is the fruit of the Spirit. 
Now, uh, and, and that's true. As I'm walking in the Spirit, my character is exhibiting faithfulness and kindness and goodness and self-control, those kinds of things, as I walk in the Spirit. But walking is a step-by-step process. I may be walking in the Spirit today, but as James said, we all stumble. And a person might stumble and decide not to walk with, with God anymore. And some have done exactly that thing. Now, I, now, you can flatter yourself and say, well, I would never, I'm not susceptible to that. I'm not vulnerable to that. And maybe you're not. But some people are. And I think it's a very uh, un, uncharitable thing, a very unhelpful thing to tell people that if they have faith today, that they're guaranteed to have it tomorrow. Because, frankly, there's just too many case studies of people, including in the New Testament, who had faith at one time, but didn't at a later time. That seed that fell on the stony ground, Jesus said, is those who believe for a while. Okay, they had faith for a while. Now, you can say, well, they didn't have the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, you're, you're inserting those words. See, that's because your theology requires that, that, uh, that qualification. That's, Jesus didn't say that. Uh, the previous group that, that fell on hard ground, it says the devil came and stole away the words so that they would not believe and be saved. Okay, suggesting if they had believed, they would be saved, but they didn't believe, and therefore they're not saved. The next group believed for a while. Now, if believing means being saved, as it does in the previous verse, we're talking about Luke 8's version of the parable of the sower here, uh, if believing means being saved, then those who believed for a while were saved for a while. And, uh, and that certainly is the teaching of Scripture. I'm not a Calvinist, and I, you know, I've given you lots of time because you called yesterday and we talked too, and you call frequently, and that's okay. But I need to take another caller. I appreciate okay, your call. Okay, thank you, Steve. All right, God bless you, Jimmy. Good, Good time. time. You. Bye now. Okay, Peter from the UK. Sorry to keep you waiting. I know it's late night where you are. How are you doing? That's fine, Steve. I'm good, thank you. Thanks for taking my call. Um, so, Steve, you gave a talk um, about the way of peace, and there was a point you made about giving up your rights. And um, my question it had to do specifically, especially in terms of, I guess, going out of your way and referencing what Jesus said about if the you know if someone asks you to go one mile, you go two miles. Um, mm -hmm. So. You know, I, in my church, I often am asked, you know, could I, you know, serve, you know, in this area of ministry or that area of ministry uh, or, you know, help out. And there are times that I, mean, I just don't want to. And I guess my question is, is, is that a, I guess as a disciple, is that a sort of a good enough reason? Is that just saying no out of integrity or should a Christian seek to you know, do more than, I guess, you know, sometimes even if you don't want to do something, but it's going out of your way. Um, I guess, yeah, so where's the fine line between that? Okay, so if somebody, if the church says, listen, we need somebody to, uh, you know, to uh, to lead the junior high school Sunday school class and, uh uh, you know, we think, uh, Peter, you'd be really good at that. Would you like to take that over? And you say, well, I, I really don't want to do that. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not saying that giving up your rights means you must do it. I would say that in a case like that, you ought to just say, well, let me, <clears throat> excuse me, let me pray about it. And if I feel like that's what God wants me to do, even if it's something I don't much want to do, I'll do it. You know, I'll do something if that's what God wants. But I'm not going to do it just because somebody else is telling me that God wants me to do it. Um, yeah. Because, uh, you know, the truth is, God does have something for me to do. And if this isn't it, this might interfere with what he does have me doing. I mean, the same hour I would spend doing that and the prep and stuff, stuff might be cutting into what God really does want me to do at that time. So I'll pray about it. And uh, this is not really the same kind of thing I was talking about, about giving up your rights, because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we're, not, we're talking about relationships here between people. If the church, which is not, uh, I mean, if the church has job uh, openings they want people to take, then it's operating not as a, a network of relationships with people so much as an organization with uh, niches to fill, you know, uh, positions to fill and so forth. Um, our relationship with an organization is not really what my lectures are about, but with people. So if the, the thing is that if somebody says, 
uh, well, listen, I wanted to uh, do something or another today, and, and that interferes with what you wanted to do, and you can't have both ways, for you to defer. Uh, I'm, and I'm talking about if you wanted to do something else, not if you're obligated to do something else. I don't, I don't think that you should ever have to give up. I, I don't think you ever are called to give up on your responsibilities in order to accommodate or please somebody else. But if it's, you know, many of the things we have uh, that we choose are really our, just our preferences. They're not really our responsibilities to do. We've got a lot of free time, most of us. Uh, and, and therefore to give up what we'd prefer, even though we have the right to do it, uh, in order to minister to somebody else or to please somebody else or to, uh, you know, be helpful to somebody else is, is giving up your rights. So when Paul, for example, Paul was uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 talking about how he had lots of rights that he gave up for the ministry's sake. He said he had the right to be married and take a wife around with him like the other apostles did, he said. Uh, he didn't do that. He might like to, but he didn't do it. He said that would hinder the gospel for him, and, and therefore he, he gave up that right. Uh, he had the right to be paid, he said, for the ministry, as some of the other apostles apparently were. Uh, he said, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't do that because he figured that could hinder the gospel, and he'd much rather just uh, just serve and uh, and let God worry about his finances rather than for him to get paid for it. And uh, so he gave up his right to have a, a guaranteed income in exchange for his ministry work. He also talked about the right to eat. And this is the main context of his making these examples anyway, because he was in chapters 8 through 10 talking about, uh, you know, how we should not eat meat sacrificed to idols uh, if it's going to stumble somebody. Uh, now, we might have the right to do so because we have liberty in Christ. And we know there's nothing really wrong with doing it. But if it's going to stumble somebody else, then my giving up my right to eat that, this is, and this is the context of this whole discussion there, my giving up my right to eat what I want to eat because my eating it would be uh, uncharitable and cause my brother to stumble, well, that's something I'm willing to do. I'm, I will, I'll give up my rights. Now, see, in all of these cases, these are instances where his uh, doing something you know, less self-serving than he might reasonably do in order to uh, advance the ministry or, or, or somebody else's well-being. This is his example of giving up his, his rights. Um, yeah, the, you don't have to give up all your rights at all times, but whenever you're in a relationship s a situation where if you do everything you're entitled to do, it's going to uh, cause a rift or an inconvenience or something for somebody else, and you have the liberty to do one way or the other for you to give up your preference and to do what will not cause that problem is what, what we're talking about doing here. Yeah, no, I, I understand now. It's, it, it, it needs to be motivated by love in a relationship context, not, uh, yeah, an institutional not church. Guilt. Which, yeah, not guilt. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. yeah, in an institutional yeah, church, yeah. if they say, we need someone to do this, and we want you to do it, and you don't feel at all like that's what you're called to do, uh, you may feel like, well, I, I, I'm going to give up my rights because I feel guilt. They're, they're guilting me about this. That's not, that's mm. not what we're talking about. We're talk like you said, it's love. If anything is not motivated by love, I don't think it's really Christian behavior anyway. Gotcha. Oh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, appreciate that. God bless you. All right, Peter. God bless you. Thanks for your call. Okay, let's see here. Barbara from Michigan. We only have a couple minutes before the break. Go ahead. Oh, hi, Steve. My question has to deal with the Garden of Eden, uh, recognizing that the garden was not destroyed. It was just guarded by the angels and the swords. Um, my question is, where about would the Garden of Eden be located? Because uh, it is here on Earth, and I, I believe that the paradise of God is the Garden of Eden, and that it still exists. That's where the saints go, you know, waiting for the marriage supper of the land. It can't be made perfect without us and all of that. Well, well let and me I give you an answer. Let me give you an answer, okay? Um, the Garden of Eden almost certainly does not exist anywhere now because in the years since that time, there was a, a flood, and that flood wiped out and changed the surface of the earth. I don't think any of the trees or plants that were growing in the garden or elsewhere before the flood are still 
growing and you know uh, and, you know still thriving. Uh, now the flood reshaped everything, including I think the surface of the earth. So uh, even though the Garden of Eden did exist after Adam and Eve were driven out of it, I don't know how long it existed because they were put in the garden to tend it and to keep it. And uh, if you've ever had a garden and then, and then didn't keep it anymore, you realize it soon goes to, it goes wild. And so without anyone there to tend the garden, there'd be nothing to prevent it from just going back to being as wild as the surrounding area that wasn't in a garden. I mean, uh, a garden is something that needs to be maintained and that garden was not maintained after Adam and Eve left. So it wouldn't be a garden at all anymore, even if it was still somewhere on the earth. Hey, I appreciate your call. We got to take a, a short break and then we have another half hour coming up to talk to more of our callers. The Narrow Path is a listener supported ministry. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. And if you want to get the mobile app, go to, on your browser, go to thenarrowpath.app and you'll see how to uh, download that. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Small is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. Welcome to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you today, but everything to give you. When the radio show is over, go to thenarrowpath.com where you can study, learn, and enjoy with free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all The Narrow Path radio shows. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. See you at thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to The Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour. Once again, our phone lines have filled up. But if you want to try to get through uh, sometime during this half hour, you can call this number, 844-484-5737. And I want to remind you, if you're in Southern California this weekend, uh, we do have two things happening on Saturday. Saturday morning, there's a men's Bible study in Temecula, and Saturday evening, there's a, a Bible study where I'm going to be giving an introduction and a survey of the whole book of Titus in Buena Park in the evening for anyone. Uh, if you're interested in those uh, gatherings, go to thenarrowpath.com. I'm assuming you don't know where they are. That's where you'll find it, thenarrowpath.com under announcements. Of course, many of you do know where those are because you come regularly, and so uh, we'll just see you there. Again, looking forward to it. All right, we're back on the phones. Uh, this time we're talking to Jerry from Allen Park, Michigan. Jerry, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, uh -huh. My question is pertaining to Galatians uh, 2.16. Okay. And most modern Bibles today have that knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even mm -hmm. we have believed in Jesus. Right. Uh, right. Most modern Bibles now have the word by faith in Jesus Christ. Could you give me your views on that and what your uh, take is of it? Yeah, to my mind, faith in Jesus Christ and faith of Jesus Christ is not... Uh, are not two different things. Um, it, it's not, they're different in English. Of and in convey slightly different ideas in English, but I believe the concept is the same. It's the faith which is pertaining to Christ. You put your faith in Christ, or, or we could say you believe in Christ, uh, or, you, or you could call it the faith that is uh, you know, with reference to Christ, of Christ. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a big difference. Uh, the, the main thing, I guess we could say, could, that could be seen as a difference is uh, faith in Jesus could specifically refer to believing in Jesus, whereas the faith of Jesus might be seen as 
the the faith system that's associated with Jesus and the the Christian uh, faith was sometimes called the faith in the early church. There's several times in the uh, in the New Testament that the, you find the term the faith referring to Christianity. Uh, now the faith would speak more of the system of belief uh, that Christians believe, uh, and faith in Christ would probably have more of a a, a function of talking about uh, trusting him the way you trust another person. Uh, both of them are really inter so in interconnected that I don't think you can have one without the other. And uh, you're right, the translators don't always uh, represent it with the same uh, preposition. And I don't, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a better Greek scholar than the translators are, so I'm not really sure I could choose between them myself. Um, so I, I will say this, uh, callers like our first caller today, you know, they, they take the phrase, the faith of Jesus Christ. And, um, and they say, you see, this is a faith that is from Jesus Christ. They don't, they don't see of referring to the idea of pertaining to Christ, but of meaning from Christ. And of course, the word of can mean that as well. But their, their theology is what's dictating that meaning to them because they believe that you don't really, you can't really have faith unless it is given to you from Jesus Christ or from God. And so that they like the term, the faith of Jesus Christ, uh, because they can, uh, they can understand it to mean the faith that comes from him. And that seems to support the doctrine they want to support, that faith is not something that we can come up with, that we can't trust because we want to trust. God has to give us the faith, which is, of course, not what the Bible says. It's true. There are verses that talk about that God has granted us faith. Uh, and most of the time, we're told that we're the ones who have to have faith. We're the ones who have to believe. We're the ones responsible for it. It's not something that we passively just receive. But as the man said to Jesus in the Gospels, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Uh, so, I mean, we, he had faith, but he needed Lord to help him have more faith, you know. And, and the disciples said that to Jesus also, by the way, in uh, the 17th chapter. I think it was, uh, let me think, it's, it's, uh, it's Luke 18, actually, I think. I think, yeah, I think, it's, no, it's Luke 17, excuse me, the beginning of Luke 17. Uh, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Now, they already had faith, of course, they were believers, but he, they wanted more faith. <coughs> Excuse me, they asked him to give them more. So, you know, we, we believe, if we do, we believe. Then, but we can say, God, increase my faith. Lord, uh, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. So there is such a thing as God helping us with our faith and giving us, uh, you know, encouragement to our faith and things like that when we need it. But uh, the faith of Jesus Christ, if if that phrase is rendered that way, let's say in a, in any given translation of Galatians uh, two twenty, um, I I would just say that it's it doesn't have to mean that it's from him or, or a gift that he gives, but rather it's the faith of the faith or the faith system that pertains to him. Uh, that is the, the the belief in Christ is essentially what it would be. Okay, thanks a lot, Steve. You have a good day. Okay, Jerry, good talk to you. God bless you. Oscar from Mount Vernon, New York, welcome to The Narrow Path. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question. Should a Christian criticize the government, or should a Christian preach that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone, and that we should love one another? What was the first part? Should the Christian be involved in government or criticize? What? I'm oh, sure no. I couldn't okay. hear the first yeah. phrase. My first question is, should a Christian criticize the government? Cri criticize the government. Or, okay. Yeah. Or should a Christian yeah. preach that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone and that we should love one another? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure why we would have to make a choice between those two things. I, I certainly... I certainly preach that we have to trust in Christ and him alone, and we don't trust in the government. But that doesn't mean we're not critics of sin where we find it. Uh, you know, we, we trust in Christ, but we also serve Christ. We are his spokesmen here. We are, his, uh, we are the prophetic voice of Christ to the world. The church, as some people have understood it uh, in their terminology, I think it was Bonhoeffer, uh, said that we, we're a conscience to the world. We're a conscience to the state. Uh, the state is there 
to govern with justice. That's what God ordained the state to do, to govern with justice. But the state sometimes, because it's secular, uh, isn't always that conscientious about governing with justice. And when they aren't being just, then the voice of, of the church, I think, is a, a rel relatively important voice for them. Because a person without a conscience will continue to do bad things. Uh, but with a conscience, they may, they may do the right thing. And certainly God wants them to do the right thing. And it, you know, it's not like we have to either preach Jesus or criticize the government. Uh, that's like say, well, should I, should I, uh, should I pr witness to people at work or should I raise my children? Well, maybe you could do both if you're going to work anyway. Maybe you could witness to people at work and you can raise your children. It's not like these are mutually exclusive activities. When you become a Christian, you are pressed into the service of the king. Uh, you're an, an agent of his kingdom. And as such, you, your voice is to be his voice. And uh, does he have any criticism of governments? Yeah, yeah, God does. God does criticize governments. You can see that, especially in the prophets, when he's criticizing, you know, well, Israel and, and Jerusalem and, and Judah, of course, but also when he criticizes Babylon and Assyria and Edom and Moab and so forth. The prophets have a lot to say about that. God doesn't like injustice. God hates injustice. And the governments are ordained by God to practice justice and to enforce justice. And when they don't do that, they are in the wrong. And the church then uh, is in the position to speak up and say, that's not good, that's not right. In Luke chapter three, it says that John the Baptist was put into prison uh, partly because he criticized Herod for marrying his brother's wife. But it says, and he criticized Herod for every other evil thing that he did. Uh, so that, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and this is uh, Luke 3, 19. It says, but Herod, the Tetrarch, being rebuked by John the Baptist concerning Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all that he shut up John in prison. So John the Baptist did criticize Herod for his personal sin of adultery, but he also criticized him for the evils he had done, no doubt his governing evils. Uh, so... To criticize evil governments is what prophets did. Now, it's true. Jesus didn't go to, you know, the Roman authorities uh, and, you know, tell them, you know, how to govern. Uh, he had a limited mission. He didn't even go to Gentiles at all. He said he was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But his disciples would be sent out to the Gentiles. So Jesus had a limited mission, and uh, it didn't involve going to uh, talk to Caesar in Rome and telling him how he ought to be doing things. However, Paul and Peter and others went to Rome, and they did speak out. Now, we remember when Paul was in prison uh, in Caesarea before he went to Rome, he had audiences with the procurator there, and he talked to him about righteousness and judgment to come uh, and, and so forth. I mean, Paul was definitely speaking into the moral conscience of that ruler, and uh, that was, I think, uh, that was Felix, I believe. And so to speak against evils that the government does and to, and to instruct the government into what's good and bad is to allow the government to rightly do the job that God ordained the government to do, but which the government doesn't know to do unless we tell them because the government is a secular uh, institution and therefore they need the instruction from the people of God to let them know what's right and wrong. So I think... I think that, uh, you know, criticizing the government is very much part of the Christian duty, uh, and it does not interfere, shouldn't anyway, with preaching mm -hmm. the gospel. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Good talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, ta we'll talk again. God bless. Okay. Uh, another East Coast caller, Junior from Virginia. Good to hear from you again. Hey, God bless you. How are you? Good. So I have a quick question, um, very quick. Um, did you watch the debate with Leighton Flowers and um, James White? And what's your thoughts? That's my question. That's all. Well, I saw the last part of it. Uh, I wasn't aware it had started until someone texted me and someone said that Leighton Flowers had mentioned me and that I should, I should uh, you know, look it up. So I did watch the last part. I don't know how much of it I missed, but uh, most of the people who commented on it seem to be commenting on the part that I did see, so I might not have missed much. Um, 
you know, my my position. Well, I mean, if if I go, if I gave you my thoughts about it, I would have to be more critical than I want to be on this program of one of the debaters. Uh, I myself debated James White five times, and I didn't find him to be uh, a pleasant person to debate. Not because he was too good, but I just felt like he wasn't a very pleasant person to debate. I, d I don't think it was hard to d defeat him on points, but he just wasn't a very, uh, he, he wasn't a very, I, I don't know what to say. I don't, want to, I don't want to criticize the man. All I can say is I'm not sure why anyone w would want to debate him. I'd rather debate somebody who really is, uh, you know, polite, let's say, not condescending, not arrogant, and things like that. I thought Leighton Flowers did a good job, at least the part I saw. I thought he was very uh, cordial, uh, very measured. I don't think he got in a huff. Uh, and I, I, I frankly felt like he won on points as well. Okay. Okay. Well, that's all. That's that's about it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good to hear all right. from you. Well, well, did you have an opinion? Did you have an opinion about the debate? Yeah, I did. Because um, I saw the first part of I saw the I saw when I saw your debate with him. I saw uh -huh. when Leighton Flowers him debated him the first time, and the second time was pretty pretty strong. It was Leighton Flowers. I guess didn't come here to play. <laughs> was, oh yeah. It was pretty strong. It, and also, it seemed as though he he got some tactics from you from you in terms of you know um stick not in terms of like the topic and talk a bit uh drifting and things like that um i, I noticed some similarities yeah well uh, leighton flowers makes no mis mo no secret of the fact that he uh he has watched my debates with uh, james white and he he has spoken well of some of the some of the things that i said there yeah all right. Well, that, I know I don't want to take up much of your time, uh, but just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, that's all. Very well. Okay, Junior. God bless. Good talking to you again. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk to uh, Kermit from Beaverton, Oregon. Hi, Kermit. Welcome. Thanks for your ministry. Uh huh. Uh, I was in Bible study, uh, a Presbyterian Bible study, last week, and one of the guys uh, brought up the Bema seat. Mm -hmm. Is the Bema seat a dispensationalist uh, idea? Well, what they say about it is a dispensationalist idea. The word Bema is the Greek word uh, for the judgment seat of Christ as that, that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5.10, where Paul says we must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ. The English says the judgment seat of Christ, but the Greek word is the Bema seat of Christ that each one, one may receive the things done in the body. Now, the, the dispensationalists believe that there are two different judgment seats, one for the Christians and one for the unbelievers. They actually believe there's a thousand years separating these, although your, uh, uh, the Presbyterians wouldn't hold this view because the Presbyterians are amillennial, but dispensationalists are premillennial, and they believe that the, the first resurrection and the first judgment is of Christians alone, and that happens before the millennium. And then they believe after the millennium, there's another resurrection and judgment, and this is of the lost alone. And therefore, you have only the, only the lost are judged at the end of the millennium, and only the righteous are judged at the beginning of the millennium. Now, I don't hold this view, but, but this is what dispensationalists believe. Now, uh, to say that Christians will stand before the Bema seat, what they argue is this. So Christians are not, they say, uh, you know, we don't have to face the judgment that the wicked have to face because we're already saved, but the Bema seat is simply the rewards seat. And they point out that the Bema, Greek word Bema, comes from the uh, judgment seat at the Olympic Games. And this is where the judges at the Olympics would uh, hand out the rewards or the, 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 the wreaths to the winners. And therefore, they say the Bema seat of Christ that's simply a place where we get rewards. It's not where the, the wicked are judged. It's where the saved are all, who are already saved are simply rewarded according to what they, you know, what, what God believes they should receive. Now, uh, then they would make a distinction between that and what they call the great white throne judgment, which is named after the expression in Revelation 20, uh, placed at the end of the millennial reign. There, he saw a great white throne 
and he who sat on it. I think that's probably verse uh, 11 in Revelation 20, if I'm not mistaken. And and then, of course, there's a resurrection and a judgment and, and the wicked who are not written in the name of uh, Lamb's Book of Life are thrown into the lake of fire and so forth. So the dispensational view is that the first judgment is the Bema seat, and that's only a rewards uh, distribution judgment, and that's only for the righteous. And then at the end of the millennium, there's a, a judgment only for the wicked, and that isn't for rewards per se. That's just for them being condemned to go to hell. Um, that's the dispensational view. By the way, that's the premillennial view, whether whether a person is dispensational or not. If they yeah. are premillennial, that's the view they hold. Now, the problem here is that there's not a reason in the world to say that the word bima uh, necessarily sets this judgment off from the great white throne judgment as if it's a different judgment. Jesus said that, uh, and this is in Matthew 25, that in verse 31, that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he'll sit on the throne of his glory and he'll call all the nations before him. At that point, he'll divide them between, he says, are the sheep and the goats. And the sheep at that judgment are rewarded by going into uh, eternal life. And the goats are uh, rewarded, as it were, by going into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, in other words, this is when Jesus comes back. There's not a, there's not a thousand year gap between where the sheep and the goats go. All the nations are brought before God at the same time, Jesus said. And at that point, he separates between the two groups and sends one group to eternal life and the other to judgment. That would suggest, of course, that there aren't uh, you know, two different judgments, one for the righteous and one a thousand years later for the unrighteous. And likewise, Jesus said in John 5, uh, 28 and 29, he said, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves shall hear his voice and come forth, some to a resurrection of life and, uh, and others to a resurrection of condemnation. So there's an hour coming where everyone is gonna be raised and judged. Some are gonna go to eternal life, some to condemnation. So it doesn't sound like Jesus had any notion of a thousand year gap between the judgment of the righteous and the judgment of the wicked. I would agree that those who are Christ's are not gonna to go to the judgment in order to find out if they're saved or not, but they are gonna to go to the judgment to have their works put on display and to be rewarded. At the same time, in the same place, the wicked will have their works put on display and they'll receive what they've got coming. So um, the dispensationalist does make a distinction between the beam of seat of Christ which they place before the millennium, and the yeah. great white throne judgment, which they place at the end. I don't think the Bible makes a distinction between those. Yeah, this this individual, Steve, was is a premillennialist, millennialist, hmm. and he's a, you know, just one of. He's teaching at a Presbyterian church. He, he, well, yeah. Well, it's a kind of a yeah. <laughs> well, some of the guys. Don't Presbyterians really are understand. usually all millennial. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. usually all millennial. So I was surprised to even hear it, and I didn't know a thing about it. So. But uh, you've explained it the way I would have thought, so I really uh, appreciate your, your dissertation on it. Okay, well, Kermit, that's, that shows the difference between the amillennial and the premillennial ideas yes, about this. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. God bless you, Steve. Thanks, Kermit. God bless you. Good talking to you. Okay, Ruth calling from Canada. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Oh, hello, Steve. Um, we listen to you from Canada, and um, I'd like to make some comments, if I may, of what you said okay. last Thursday. Okay. I, uh, um, I have studied the Bible for 11 years or more, and uh, to start with, uh, God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be his people, for people to love and serve him and to evangelize the world uh, when Jesus came. And um, from Judah, Jesus, uh, well, King David and Jesus came from one of the sons of Judah, one of the twins. And uh, the last king that was uh, rain, raining was uh, Jehoiachin, uh, that he was the last one to reign in uh, Judea.
but his um, daughter went with King um, with um, with Jeremiah to uh, ended up in uh, Ireland, and then eventually um, the descendants went on to the throne of of David in uh, England. And I have researched all that, Ezekiel 17 and Ezekiel 21, 26, and 27. And and the ten tribes, uh, what I have studied, are not lost. When the Assyrians took them north, eight years later, they also took all of the cities of Judea. And that's in Second Kings 18, 13. And... And Jerusalem was taken 130 years Hello? later. A, a remnant oh, of hey, Jews were, hey, I'm gonna were to, taken. I'm going to yes? have to stop you. I'm going to have to. I appreciate the fact that you listen. I, I have to stop you here, only because we don't have time for a, a whole dissertation on this. And frankly, I, I don't believe that you're understanding those passages correctly. I'm a, I'm aware of the doctrine called Anglo-Israelism, which teaches that the ten tribes to the north migrated into England and that the Anglo-Saxon people are the actual uh, descendants of the Israelites to the north. I don't believe that's true. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I, I realize you've studied it for 11 years. My, my studies of the Bible have been uh, somewhat in excess of that. But the, the point is that uh, I, if it were true, I couldn't care less. Who do I care who Israel is? God doesn't care who, who's racially Israel. I mean, I don't believe it's true that the Anglo-Saxons, uh, and by the way, my, my ancestry is almost entirely Anglo-Saxon, but I don't believe we're, we're the Israelites. Uh, that is Anglo-Israelites, uh, uh, you know, coming from the ten tribes. Uh, I don't think the evidence is proof of that. But, I, but if someone wants to believe that, I think, oh, so what? Uh, you know, there's a, an opposite view out there, which is a big cult now, called the Black uh, Israelites. Uh, uh, and they, they believe that, they, uh, that the, the African people are the original Israelites. So it's just the opposite of the Anglo-Israelites. Uh, the truth is that neither view has biblical support. But even if it did, it's totally a distraction because I, I wouldn't care if the, the African people were the Israelites or if the uh, people in the British Isles were the Israelites. Wh who cares? I don't even care if the people in the Middle East are Israelites uh, because the truth is that God doesn't judge people or evaluate people by their ancestry. Uh, he never has. Uh, if you want to read Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, Paul makes it very clear. God doesn't make any distinction between Jews and Gentiles, but, but uh, you know, the wicked will be punished uh, the Jew first and also the Greek, uh, and, and the righteous will be rewarded, uh, the Jew first and also the Greek. So, so the Jew and the Greek, the Jew and the Gentiles will all be rewarded uh, according to their works, and nobody is going to be rewarded according to who their ancestors were. So uh, first of all, I don't, I don't agree with your analysis of where the ten tribes are, but, but even if it's true, and I, I, to me it's the least interesting of all possible doctrines, because I don't care where the Israelites are, who they are, uh, because actually the people of God today are not the people who have ethnic origins from Israel. The people of God today are the people of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus Christ. But I appreciate your call. I just ran out of time. I couldn't let you continue uh, you know, through the end of the program because we have to end it. And that's what we're doing right now. You're listening to The Narrow Path. Uh, we are listener supported. You can write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or you can go to our website. Everything at the website is free. Or you can donate at thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow.